Mother's Day backstory. The Life and Times of Mary Hannah Morrison Walker, 1917-1990 By Richard A. Walker, May 12, 2019 Missionaries in India, now Pakistan John Hunter Morrison, Mary's second great-grandfather and the son of a Scottish immigrant, was born on Honeypot Farm, Wallkill, N.Y. on the 29th of June, 1806. He earned the Doctorate of Divinity, from Princeton University, married Ann M. Ward in 1837, and sailed to India as a missionary. Tragically, his end died shortly after disembarking in India. John Hunter Morrison remarried, name, but she died childless as well. However, with his third wife, name, they produced three children, one of which was Robert born 1855. Like his father John, Robert Morrison was graduated from Princeton University and returned to India as a Presbyterian missionary. He married Annie Heron, the daughter of American missionaries, David Heron and Mary L. Browning, in what is now Pakistan. They produced seven little Morrisons. The next to the youngest son, Robert Morrison, born 1889, returned to the USA in 1900 to attend a Presbyterian high school in Massachusetts. He then joined his family in 1903 when they took up residence in Clearfield, Pa, where Reverend Robert Morrison pastored two small churches, of which one was in Big Run, 13 miles south of Du Bois. Back in the USA, Big Run, Pennsylvania. After being graduates from high school, Robert and his brothers worked in the Du Bois sawmill, learning the forestry trade. But, it was in Big Run that it was most likely that the 25-year-old Robert met Mary Hannah Pence, five years his junior, at his father's church in the Single Street Village of Big Run, as it is still the only church in the village. She was graduated from Du Bois High School and Wilson College in Chambersburg, Pa. After one semester at Penn State, Robert left for Baton Rouge Law to attend LSU in 1915. However, he returned in 1917 to marry Mary Hannah Pence, the daughter of William C. Pence and Tacey Ross Pence. Mr. Pence was a lawyer, mayor, and land speculator in Du Bois, Pa. All three of his sons practice law in his firm, in Du Bois, Pa. Cloverly Farm, Cut Off, Louisiana 1917. Robert and Mary journeyed by train to New Orleans, Louisiana, where Mary P. Morrison gave birth to Mary Hannah Morrison, on November 9, 1917. Little Mary and her parents lived on a houseboat on a bayou near where her father reclaimed land for a wealthy Englishman named Scully. Mary's mother called her Moses, because she lived in the bulrush. Unfortunately, Little Mary could only say Moe, being too young to pronounce an S sound. She was called Moe until she died. In 1917 the Great Influenza started in a Kansas army camp, went to Belgium and France with the troops and then around the world. In January 1919, it returned to cut off Louisiana and took Mary Pence Morrison at age 25. Little Mary was only 16 months old. However, she grew up with her father and 60-year-old grandparents on Cloverly Farm in the Bayou Country near cut off La Rouge Parish, Louisiana. In 1921, Mary's 32-year-old father married Doris Cooper, a 19-year-old schoolteacher and now stepmother. The second Mrs. Morrison gave Robert three daughters to keep Moe company. There was Doris, Elizabeth, Betty, and Margaret, Cricket. In spite of being motherless, living in the swamp of Louisiana, her parents and grandparents cared for her. She was graduated from Du Bois High School, like her mother, and like her mother was graduated from college. In Little Mary's case, it was from Louisiana State College, LSU, with a degree in home economics. While at LSU, Baton Rouge, now mature Mary met Lindsay Burness Walker. They married at her parents' home on Cloverley, on Christmas Day 1938. The War Years In 1939 the Walkers moved to Seward Square, Washington, 
DC, a seven minute, point four mile walk from the Library of Congress where Burness had secured a job. In 1940 Mary sold the stock portfolio started for her by her maternal grandfather, William C. Pence. It allowed the walkers to purchase a car and make a down payment on a new house at 2300 Cheverly Avenue, Cheverly, Maryland. They moved in in 1941, but by that time the war in Europe was making life tense around the world. In addition to several of his brothers and sisters coming to Washington, D. C. Looking for a more prosperous life, Bernice's 16-year-old sister, Vela came to live with them. Like her grandmother Annie Morrison, Mary at 25, had a son named Robert on January 14, 1942. Later that year Bernice applied for a direct commission in the U.S. Navy. Mary and Veda moved to Upper Darby, a neighborhood of Philadelphia, PA, where Bernice's ship, the Atlantic Fleet flagship, USS Vixen, would frequently dock. September 4, 1944, Veda gave birth to Catherine and moved to John's parents' farm near Baltimore. It is probable that Mary and baby Bob moved back to Cheverly when Bernice was transferred to the USS Cincinnati in 1943. Sandcroft, Clinton, Maryland. After the war, Bernice returned to the Library of Congress, and he and Mary continued having babies. Richard was born in March 1946, Donald in April 1949, and Stephen in July 1950. In 1948 the Walkers moved from Cheverly to Sandcroft Farm, a 10-acre slice of a sandy tobacco farm in Clinton, Maryland only 13 miles south of Capitol Hill and the library. The 15-acre tract was to be divided into three five-acre tracts creating a family community by Bernice and two of his brothers. However, Bernice ended up with 10 acres and his brother James took the adjacent five. The brothers ultimately built facing ranch-styled homes facing each other around a circular drive. Mary and the Boys Outnumbered five to one, Mary had her hands full, managing the Walker household. However, Mary had use of the 1942 Plymouth Coupe, called Old Betsy, on days Bernice did not have carpool duty, which may have been twice per week. Weekly Mary drove to the closest chain grocery store, A&P, or Dr. Dufault's, the pediatrician, or Morton's department store 10 miles away in southeast Washington. Mary also made frequent social visits to see Veda now Mrs. Dorsey and her three children at the Anacostia Naval Base in southeast Washington. On school days, the boys walked a quarter mile to the school bus stop and frequently stopped at Uncle Jim and Aunt Susie's house on Clayton Lane, on the way home from school. Howdy Doody was on the 15-inch black and white console TV followed by Westerns on Footlight Theater. Luckily both Mary and Susie had telephones that could be used to summon the wee kids home before Bernice arrived home at 6 or 6.30 depending on traffic or if they men stopped for a beer on the way. The Rural Life in Washington, D. C. While Sandcroft was rural in its fabric of pastures, creeks and woods, an exurban enclave, and surrounded by the tentacles of Washington, District of Columbia, it was only a modest 13-mile, 30-minute drive to the capital of the United States of America, the most powerful nation in the world, with all the goods and services one could ask for. Unlike the rest of the nation, it boasted three TV network stations, multiple radio stations for every kind of music, a single party, analog telephone system, 11 universities and the first and 21st highest county per capita income in the country, interstate highways service, military bases, airport service, plus rail and bus service round the clock. In the 1940s, Washington, D.C. swelled in population to meet the demands of the WWII. There were barracks-like offices filling them all. In the 1950s, when cars became available the, the southwest quarter of the city was abandoned for suburbia and totally white surrounding southern Maryland and north of Virginia counties. Over the years Sandcroft was surrounded by new subdivisions, schools and shopping centers. Home Life on Sandcroft 
Note. In Scotland and the UK, croft is a synonym for a farm. The Walker household was run by a repetitive schedule. Bernice got up at 5.30 to 6.00 o'clock to feed the horse and milk Anna the golden Guernsey cow. Mary prepared a breakfast for the grade school kids. Of OJ, eggs either scrambled, poached or fried, toast and milk if desired. She made sack lunches and made sure they had milk money. Bernice was out the door by seven and the boys cut across the field to meet the paved cedar lane, which led to the bus stop at Woodyard Road. Mary's domestic chores were accompanied by the Arthur Godfrey radio show with the Andrews sisters in the morning and Eddie Gallagher in the afternoon on the plastic, forward grained GE radio that sat on the dining room shelf. The big band melodies were daily fare in the Walker household. Mary sewed clothes for the boys, from chicken feed sacks, washed and hung clothes out to dry on a four-aluminum wire clothesline that sometimes acted as a radio antenna on which Mary heard and bound pilots chat at the Andrews Air Force Base Control Tower, five miles to the north. Dinner was on the table by 6.30 p.m. seven days per week. Each day of the week had its typical menu. Monday was chicken, Tuesday through Friday were casseroles containing pasta and hamburger meat, Saturday was grilled hamburgers on the porch, and Sunday was a roast. The beef and chicken was made plentiful from animals raised on Sandcroft. Daily Mary would visit the garden for fresh vegetables, or to the basement storage for canned tomatoes etc. Food Management in the Garden one cannot imagine what privations our parents endured during the Great Depression of 1928, the Dust Bowl of 1930s, and rationing in the 1940s for the war effort. In the 1950s, 1960s and even the 1970s food management was a major part of life. Each spring, Bernice and Mary, with very little help from the boys and a lot of grumbling, planted a one and a half acre vegetable garden. The boys spread the composted soil from the chickens, cow and horse manure, and pulled or hoed the competing weeds, all summer. However, it was left to Mary to harvest the ripening veggies for suppers from June to September. In addition she gathered and canned the excess tomatoes, pickled the beets and cucumbers, made onion relish, froze corn, peaches, and made applesauce. She also made strawberry and grape jam and preserves. It was a never-ending job with a delicious result. While the boys fed the chickens and collected the eggs daily, Mary processed the two to four gallons of raw milk provided by Hannah. The cream was skimmed from large pans and the remaining whole milk poured into quart mason jars. More cream would rise to the top of each quart of milk, collected and stored in additional quart jars. When four quarts of cream accumulated, they were emptied into a butter churn. One of the sons got to crank the churn for 20 minutes until the butter and buttermilk separated. Mary processed that butter into blocks and wrapped it for freezing or sending to relations for their table. The excess milk was given or sold to family as well as some of the eggs. However, Bernice loved to drink the buttermilk. Friends, Family, and Self While the bulk of Mary's family lived in southern Louisiana, her daily life centered on her immediate family and those of Bernice's family who had moved to the Washington metro area. Jim and Susie lived in a facing house. Veda and John lived on the other side of Clinton, and Owen and Mary live in northern Virginia. Moni Dell and Carl Schnubble lived in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. Her aunt Helen Pence and uncles lived in Du Bois, western Pennsylvania. On her father's side, her aunt Margaret lived in New York City. She had a very comfortable relationship with her two aunts. In post WWII telephones were plentiful, but to call long distance was pricey. Consequently, parent and adult children corresponded by letter. Like today, a busy and uneventful home life left little time and things to write about. Mary was active in Christ Episcopal Church, in Clinton, M.D.
the Right Reverend Paul Stoutzenberger pastored a very social congregation. The Thanksgiving and Shrove Tuesday dinners were very popular and open to the community. Mary also participated in the annual rummage sale and sewing circles for the women. Growing up in isolation in Louisiana and even in suburban Maryland, Mary learned to play cards at an early age. She organized and hosted card parties for lady pals. The play canasta or bridge. She said that her friends could not read her poker face and she normally won either the first or booby prize. In the 1960s and 70s, Mary had a close friend named Rosemary, who had either an autistic or paraplegic son. Mary spent one afternoon each week with Rosemary or took care of her son so Rosemary could get out to do errands. Mary Walker was a fan of mystery novels. She ordered them by the case. She would much prefer to sit at home to slip off into a novel rather than go to the movies or watch TV with Bernice and the boys. She introduced Richard to Sherlock Holmes and the copycat novels about Solar Ponds and his sidekick, Dr. Parker, penned by August Erleff. Travel Bernice and Mary loved to travel and learn about new places and cultures. Twice they flew to Europe to visit son Richard and family who were there in the army. Another time, Mary took a trip with several lady friends to the Netherlands in Copenhagen. While Bernice, as a member of the Capitol Hill Naval Reserve Group, took several tours of foreign bases with members of Congress. On one occasion Bernice and Mary were driving along a secondary road in Bavaria when they passed a refugee camp. Mary began to explain facts about the camp that she had gleaned from a mystery novel. After Bernice retired in 1971, they began to travel more. They purchased a 36-foot-long Airstream land yacht and joined the good neighbor Sam and Wally Byam Travel Associations. They wintered at Traveler's Rest Resort in Dade City, Florida and actively took part in caravan rallies all over the USA, Canada, and Mexico. They even sponsored a few at Sandcroft for the Northern Virginia Wally Byam Association. The Troubles Not mentioned here are the internal family frictions and heartaches the Walker men presented to Mary. But, Mary Hannah Morrison Walker, who had grandmothers and sisters who showed her love, stood by her boys through thick and thin, which benefited her and grounded them. The End in July 1989, Mary at age 72 was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Bernice and Mary planned a final caravan journey to visit her sons and break the news personally. First they trekked to Southern California to see Robert Bobby. By January they were in Traveler's Rest, Dade City of Florida, where Richard could visit them from Cape Coral. They returned to Sandcroft Farm to wait for the end. Mary who had grown to a plump 180 pounds, starved to 90 pounds in her last months. No one knew her head was shaped like her ever slender father's. Mary died, April 1990, at home, in the corner bedroom looking over the garden in which she had spent many hours of her life. Bernie said her last words were, I want to serve. On May 30th, 1990 Mary Ashes were center stage in Christ Episcopal Church Clinton. There were many unfamiliar faces present, but the reception in the parish hall was somber and Bernice disappeared to gain the refuge of his home, where Mary's spirit remain, or at least our memories of her. Years later Bernice related that on one of his journeys home from Florida to Sandcroft, he had many interesting things that he wanted to share with his wife of 52 years. But she wasn't there. He came face to face with the emptiness caused by the absence of his lifelong friend and partner. She once lamented that she wished her sons were happier. I wish that I could communicate to her in heaven that they all turned out fine and happy. We owe our emotional ability to Mary Hannah Morrison, a woman filled with compassion and love but felt awkward showing it. However, we her sons got the message and appreciate her more than anyone will ever know.